Good afternoon, everybody. It is Thursday, March 14th. Hard to believe that we're already halfway through this month. I am Jenny Guy, Marketing Manager for Media Mind, and you are here for Teal Talk. We are super excited to have Matt Mullen with us today of Personalized Paths. Matt is a guru of something that a lot of bloggers avoid because it seems too complicated and like too much work for them. So we are here to demystify all of that for you. And Matt, tell us a little bit more of what you do and what Personalized Paths is. Just welcome sure. to Teal Talk. Well, thank you very much. It's awesome to be here. Um, just as a little bit of background, I have worked with startups and small businesses for the last oh, 20 plus years. And I have always loved the, the excitement and the adventure of entrepreneurship. But I do know that there's a feeling of overwhelm that comes where you have, as an entrepreneur, you have so many things that you have to do. And I know that, you know, many of uh, Mediavine's publishers, gosh, they struggle with, um, you know, of course, they've got to create their content and then they've got to promote their content. Email is often way down the list. So I want to tell you a little bit about my story, my journey and how I got into got into email. Um, so I started with a company uh, almost 10 years ago. A friend of mine said, hey, come start this. It was a very small company. Come do this with me. It was e-commerce company, but we had literally no money. We were completely bootstrapped. And so I had to figure out ways to drive uh, customer acquisition, to drive sales without any money. So I learned the ins and outs of using email to drive business. And over time, that email list became a really important part of that business's revenue stream. I, mean, I think we were doing we were doing you know close to fifteen million dollars in in revenue just from the email just from the emails that we sent out. So it was it was super important to us. So during that time, I learned a lot about how you can use email to build a brand, to sell products, and to and to connect with um, with your audience. So I then have taken that and I've implemented it. Uh, those tactics and those techniques that I learned before, I've implemented those on my own businesses, on my own blogs, and they have seen great success. And so for the last uh, almost uh, for the last year or so, I've been consulting with some of the very best bloggers in the world to help them make more of their email marketing efforts. I through the process, I, I, I do consulting um, through personalized paths. I have a uh, email course called email on autopilot for those that want to do a, a, a you know take it at your own pace and 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 do the whole digital course thing but so email is a real passion of mine because it is one of the the most powerful marketing tools that you can have in your arsenal for any small business or any business of any size actually excellent so if you're just joining us we're here with Matt Mullen from personalized Paths, and we are talking about email something that many bloggers avoid talking about. And Matt, actually, I want to go ahead and mention you actually have a new course that is free. People visit emailjumpstart.com. There are three live and visual resources in the form of video on growing your list, how to write an email that gets open and clicked, and how to put your best content on autopilot through email. Yeah, so that's brand new. Just launched to just launched today. So go check that out. I think it's a, it's a great it's a great primer for um, a lot of my strategies. So it's a it's a really uh, useful tool, I think. And congratulations on that launch. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline Meldrum says, "Hey, from Dundee, Scotland." Wow. Hi, wow. Jacqueline. Bonjour. And Amy Sugarman says, "Hi, Matt and Jenny." <laughs> Hi, Hi Amy. Amy. Okay, so. First, let's just start with the basics. Why email? Let's convince someone who isn't currently using it. Why sure. Is it worth it? Or okay. Great it? question. And you know, we had a lot of stuff that has happened in the last twenty-four to I don't know hundred hours that have. If you if you're not paying attention to these things and and this doesn't convince you, I don't know what will. Did anybody miss Facebook or Instagram yesterday? You missed the engagement with your followers, um, the ability to get instant uh, feedback or better yet traffic back to your site i know that i missed it and i know that a lot of people that i work with did too um we have the facebook apocalypse of i don't know last last year whatever um these uh oh google google just announced that they are releasing a new update they're calling it florida update 2 that's happening right now who knows what that's going to do to our individually to our individual um, uh, search traffic. What I'm going with this is that we don't own those marketing channels. 
These are just good reminders of these people that have these businesses that have control over um, where our tra how we get our traffic and how we engage with our users, whether that's the Facebook companies, whether that's Google, whether that's Pinterest, there's rumor that Pinterest is changing how they're going to do their feeds. So a lot of our processes will have to change for that. Obvious point here is that you can, number one, own your list. Get a place that you can actually control, where you can press a button and you have a pretty good uh, certainty that the people that you want to reach will hear from you and have a chance to continue to engage with you. That's number one. But number two, you know, and that's the that's the, the thing that is, is, is top of mind. And I, I don't discount that. But where the real power comes in, and I think a lot of people miss this, is that email is a fabulous way to have real engagement with the person on the other side of the screen. You can communicate in, in, um, in a very detailed, uh, very intimate manner um, with them and anticipate their needs and solve their problems. Email, you can do that through email in a way that you can't do with any other mass medium for marketing. And that leads to brand building. You know, right now, many of my the people that I work with, I know that a lot of people that come to your um, to, to Teal Talk, they are trying to make a name for themselves. They're trying to build a brand. They're trying to stand out. If I've got a recipe blog, how am I different from, I don't know, Real Simple or uh, Rachel Ray? How am I different? How am I special? Um, building a brand can happen in a fantastic way through email when you anticipate people's needs and you start attaching your name and your picture and and your advice and your solutions in their inbox they start making this this connection with you even though you're on opposite sides of that screen which can ultimately lead to super fans super fans are the people that open all your stuff they 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 click all your links they 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 tell their mothers about you um they buy, buy all their products it's fantastic so um and today, I mean, I know a lot of people are working on SEO, a lot of people are working on social media, but I am imploring you to consider the power that email can have. Um, I've seen it so many, many times. And um, if you do it right, it can be your absolute most powerful marketing tool. That's a great answer. And it actually goes along with what we always say in terms of getting that traffic to your website. And I always then add to that capture them on your list, but that's what you own. You don't own right. any of these social media platforms and that could you know with the algorithm shift. Sherry Smotherman Short actually said, uh, did y'all tell Facebook to go down yesterday to emphasize how important email is? Yeah. She yes. That with us. I have a staple of uh, stable of Russian hackers um, that I just use every time I'm gonna go on Teal Talk. It was really just a staging technique. Yeah. We're glad we proved our points. That's so, good marketing. Yeah. Uh, I hope we're not, I don't know if we still have audio trouble. People were saying they might have been having a little trouble hearing me. But please note, if you have questions for Matt, please post them. We'll, get, we'll ask them and we'll get the answers. Okay. From the beginning, how do you grow your subscriber list? What are the best ways to capture? Yeah, this is always question number one, right? Is how do I how do I actually build a list? How do I grow the list? Well, the for anybody, and I believe that uh, that Mediavine publishers that this this fits them. Anybody that um, has existing traffic, the very best way to get to build your list is to use your existing traffic. But let's talk about that for a second. So let's think about your reader for a second. You've got somebody that are your visitor to your site. They're coming to your site in what I call transaction mode. Um, let me give you an example. Somebody, um, she, uh, she gets hungry, she Googles cinnamon rolls. And when she hits cinnamon rolls, she sees some she sees some results. She clicks on those results. They take her to a website. There's a recipe on that website. What does she do then? Well, she make, maybe she maybe she's in the kitchen at the moment. She makes the, the cinnamon rolls. They're delicious and it's wonderful. But as far as she's concerned, her transaction is complete. She was there to make to to do something specific. You facilitated that. But then what happens? She bounces about 90 percent of our traffic acts like that ends up bouncing after one page because their transaction is either yeah you, know, you didn't you didn't you know actually have some enrolls on your site or whatever um or you you solved their initial problem which was hey i want to i want to know how to make cinnamon rolls so what we need to do is we need to get that reader to stop in her tracks to get her out of transaction mode and get her more into um okay what do they got here so the way that we do that is this is probably familiar to a lot of people 
Um, the, the concept is called an email hook or a lead magnet or an opt-in. You know, there's lots of different names for these. And there's lots of different types of email hooks. Um, there's printables, there's downloadables, there's, um, there's full-blown courses, et cetera. The, the big problem, um, well, the problem that, that we have with most email hooks, there's, there's one of two problems. Number one, they're either really time consuming or costly to make, right. like a course or, or a, a super pretty ebook has a cost to it. Or two, they're not all that effective at actually attracting the reader that we want. You can, get a, you can get a printable and they get on the list. Great, I got my free thing and then I'm gone, right? So I have come up with my favorite recommendation for building a, uh, a list that is thriving, that is full of our actual target reader, the people that we can serve the best. I call it a quick start guide. So the concept with a quick start guide is that we know why they are there on our site for the most part. In the case of the cinnamon rolls, we know, we know that, that they've arrived with something in mind. It's as if we're gonna take our arm and we're gonna put our arm around their shoulder and we're gonna say, guys, here's what's next. I anticipate your next problem. And as you know, with a quick start guide, anybody that's learning a topic, they just wanna get started fast. They don't need the whole Wikipedia of, of how to do everything about the yeast and the gluten and the, you know, how many watts your microwave should have. You know, they don't need all that stuff. They just want to know. Yeah. They just want to know what do I, what are the first steps I need to take? So if you've been blogging for any amount of time, you probably have a lot of great content that you can package together and create what I call, as I mentioned, the quick start guide. So here's how that works. You take a topic that solves a problem for most of your readers. And then um, over the course of uh, three to five days, they get one email each day that is its own lesson, okay, as part of this quick start guide topic. And the lesson, this is the nice thing about it, the lesson is something that already exists on your website. Let me give you um, a, a, a little bit more of an example on that. So if you're, let's say you're a, a vegan food blogger, a vegetarian food blogger. Somebody coming to your website might want to know, hey gosh, how do I, uh, um, your quick start guide could be uh, the beginner's guide to eating vegan, how to transform your diet. So somebody's there for vegan recipes, they might be in that mode, they might be thinking about that. They're, okay, great. When they sign up, email number one can be, um, gosh, uh, here, are the, here are the most common foods that, that uh, vegetarians love to eat and contain the, the best nutrients for you. Click here for my article about superfoods. And each lesson is different like that, but they all fit together in that theme, if that makes sense. So some of my, um, some of my clients are using this to, to, a, um, to really great benefit where they're, they're able to grab their target reader, bring them on board, and it actually is not that hard to build because you're using existing content. But it's better than like a printable where they grab it and they go, they don't know you. But think about this, if you're, if you're in somebody's inbox for three to five days, and for three to five days, you're solving a particular problem that they're interested in. They very quickly go from, oh, that was just some vegan site that I Googled, to, holy cow, Jenny is an expert on this stuff. She knows, you know, she knows how to solve my problems. And every time she sends me an email now going forward, I'm gonna trust her. And then you're moved from transaction mode into Jenny as the vegan superfoods expert, right? Um, Which is so I, I don't know what you have for lunch, Jenny, but I'm, not <laughs> so anyway there's a couple of examples that i wanted to share of this because a lot of people say okay give me you know tell me what that's like in action so um ali at baking a moment she created a quick start guide called five secrets to impossibly soft cookies i mean that who doesn't that stop right i mean everybody stops to it. okay impossibly soft cookies i gotta know what that's all about and then over five days she sends them incredible cookie recipes amy's on here i see her there um, you should go check out hers. She has a quick start guide called Become a Better Baker, where she sh shares some of her, her, her favorite recipes, but they're also couched with secrets and tips. So she's gone from um, not just recipes to she's teaching you something. Um, Chelsea's MessyApron.com. She has Easy Meal Secrets, How to Make Mealtime Hassle-Free. My wife has a Disney Cruise blog, uh, PictureTheMagic.com. If you want to see how we do it. Um, it's called what to expect on a Disney cruise because 
if you ever have thought about going on a cruise, it's its own thing and it's overwhelming and you want to be magical. So what to expect is a great starting place for these people. So did that make sense, Jenny? Did that, the quick start guide concept? Yes, it absolutely did and it was whole advice. We've got a question now. Diana says it would be useful if you can recommend plugins to get users to sign up. I personally sure. get it when I get lots of pop-ups when I visit a website, what's the best way to do it? Where yeah. to sign up for? Okay, so that kind of goes into how do you, so how do you actually share whatever your, your, your lead magnet or your, your email hook is. So about Diana, I, I totally get you. I hear you, pop-ups tend to be annoying and we have to be careful when we use them. I will say, however, that they convert like crazy. That's why they exist. And when you do it right, you can actually be providing a, an actual, a value to your reader. Um, so the way that you would, and I'm going to sell you on the pop-up concept here for just a second, in how it doesn't just have to be annoying. If you truly have identified a problem that you're solving for your reader, and they're on your page and they're in transaction mode, um, giving them the opportunity to say, hey, look over here, I have the, the, the answer to your next question, I've anticipated your next problem, um, it actually can be very, very useful. So when it's done well like that, and it's not just, hey, sign up for my newsletter. I mean, who cares? Who cares about that, right? Mm -hmm. That's what most people do. But when you get five secrets to impossibly soft cookies, in a moment when I'm, I'm on Allie's Baking a Moment site because she's, she's great at baking, I'm, okay, that resonates with me. And yeah, I, that, that actually provides me with value. So there's other ways to do it too. Um, you know, sidebars, um, of course, uh, you know, I, I'm an advocate for, for putting forms as many places as it makes sense, as, as you can get away with it, where it feels natural. Um, and you, that's kind of a feeling thing that you know as you're doing your own design. The pop-up software itself, I think that's always the next question. There's lots of different options out there. Optin Monster is, you know, the gold standard, but they're super expensive. Um, AppSumo does a nice job again. Um, Thrive Leads is one that I've been using lately because it has a nice balance of affordability works with WordPress. I've only been using it for the last three months, but it, um, you might want to check them out. So um, yeah, there's lots of different ways to go about it. Excellent. Uh, Jack and Malcolm says, such good advice. I've been sending out automatic emails as I'm never regular at sending out emails and my numbers and opens are gradually decreasing. Yeah, okay. So I want to talk about those automated emails. Um, how do I say this nicely? Um, Okay, I'm just gonna say, you guys already know, nobody nobody likes to receive those, right? All that is, is a machine, your your WordPress software or your, your RSS feed saying, guess what? Jenny's blog just had an update. That's not personal, that's not solving my problem. Um, Jenny could, that day she could have posted about I don't know, window cleaner that she really loves and it's affiliate play and she's really doing it for SEO purposes, but she's a she's a flipping vegan blog, right? So what does window cleaner have to do with that? And then it shows up in my feed, I, right? So I actually have a different technique um, because Jack, I know this is, you were asking this question, um, what to send your readers. And my, my technique is completely different. Um, I want to think about, in fact, when I started doing this, I was surprised that more people don't do this because this is like gold for content creators. Let's go back to this concept of your, your, your website is a store. Somebody walks in the store for your freebie. They're there, they get your free thing, thank you very much. You solved my problem for three to five days in a row with your quick start guide, wonderful. If you can then say, look, I know what's next. Let me put my arm around your shoulder and show you You've been blogging for years, some of you for, for over a decade. You have awesome content. You have awesome content that you wrote last week and you have awesome content that you wrote last year and you have awesome content that you wrote in 2013. Now that stuff that in 2013 is probably buried, but it doesn't make it any less awesome. So what if we can bring that forward and use that existing content? So what I suggest we do is create I, I, I gave this a silly name, but I call it the forever series. And the idea is that when somebody gets onto your list, you have already written and thought out the order of emails that you're gonna send them. 
can I use my wife's Disney Cruise blog for, as an example for just a second? Sure. Um, so think about that that reader for a moment. Now, Alicia has written content since since we launched in 2016. She's been writing content sporadically, blah, blah, blah. Um, that reader is in that moment thinking about Disney Cruise tips, gets signed up, gets the what to expect quick start guide. The very first thing that we send, whether it's June 1st or Halloween or January 1st, it doesn't matter. The very first thing that everybody gets, if it's their first email, it's called the most powerful Disney Cruise tip I ever learned because it is legit the very best thing that we have to offer. And so they get that, they get nailed with that with the very first email. The second email is, um, I have to remember, but it's something along the lines of uh, what's included in your Disney cruise. So it's all about, that's dollars and cents. Number three is about what to pack and so forth. You go on down and there's things like seasickness and, and stuff that people are worried about, but in the order that it makes sense to send it because they can't absorb all those, all that information all in one week. You send, if I sent them everything that's on the site, they wouldn't read it. So you send them one per week at a time. Now, by the time you get to like number 10, Alicia sends, um, the email is called uh, trip insurance. Do you need it? Something like that. And it's an affiliate play where we have an arrangement with you know, a trip insurance, a travel insurance company where we get a kickback if somebody signs up. And it's a very thoughtful answer to that question. But if we had sent that as number one, that reader, <laughs> they'd be like, okay, I see they're just trying to sell me something. They don't care about me. Gone. That's the total difference with the RSS driven emails. If that had been what I wrote that day and it was the first experience with a subscriber and they get that, there's no connection there. So the forever series, we take those emails, we put them in order, we let the automated software run itself. And there's a lot of great software companies that do this today that, where you can set that up. So don't freak out about the how so much because that is definitely, definitely doable. Um, it's just more thinking about your reader's journey. You know, What is the next problem that you can solve for them in the order that makes the most sense? Well, the more you the more your uh, company name comes apt. <laughs> I love it. It's all about the curated experience um, addressing the reader. I love it. Uh, so we have a question here. Sheena Strangampo and as well as Sherry Potter and George, they want to know what you feel about single opt-in versus double opt-in. Yeah. Sherry said, so some people say that we should have different opt-ins that vary from where they were on their blog when they signed up. Okay, if I understood the, correct, the, the, the question correctly, number one was, what about single opt-ins versus double opt-ins? And number two, should you have multiple opt-in forms on your site? Was that it? Did mm -hmm. I get that right? Okay, so single opt-in versus double opt-ins. I have a controversial take on this. I don't, I don't claim for this to be the gospel truth here, but my belief, and my, my strategy is I do single opt-in because I want them on their list instead of, I want to eliminate friction between me giving them the content they, that they want. So I, I get them onto the list as quickly as I can. And I try to provide them with amazing content without ask, asking them to go take another action. And then if they don't want my stuff, I prune like crazy. Okay. I'm just very aggressive about cleaning, uh, you know, a uh, list cleanup, you know, once a month, once every other month, um, I'm in there, I'm wiping them out, I'm, I'm cleaning them out. So if they don't want it, I don't, I don't care. I don't want them on there. There's a, the number of subscribers that I have on a list, everybody always talks about the size of their list or whatever. That's just a vanity metric. Um, that's not that important to me. So I don't know if that answers that question, but I, I believe, you know, I, I definitely, I know that that might be controversial, but I, that's how I do it. Um, and then the other one is absolutely, uh, the question, just to repeat the question, if I understood it, is, should I have different opt-ins and different um, ways to bring people onto my list? Absolutely, the more the better. So this whole concept of a quick start guide, I usually employ that for, like if you don't have anything else going on, which most of us don't, we have like the, hey, subscribe here. Nobody does that, nobody subscribes there. So take that off and instead give them your quick start guide of how to do such and such that solves your problem. That'll get a broad number of people coming in but maybe you do have a printable. Well, yeah, I still use printables as an opt-in form. And maybe you do have um, a very narrow niche over here. You're, you're selling doTERRA or something and that audience is very small. I might have a doTERRA guide just on those pages. 
your our technology today allows us to create sidebars and 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 footers and um, uh, custom pop-ups depending on where you are on the site. So absolutely, it's all about thinking through what how do I solve that reader's problem next? Absolutely. Okay. Do you recommend? Oh, we just discussed that a little bit. So every we've got lots of questions and people are really having trouble hearing me and they're recommending I pull off my hair, headphones. They're already off. So okay. issue. That's a little better. Uh, okay. Um, so Sheena Strang says, follow up read the single option. What about spam? I see all sorts of stuff about mass bot signups. Is that an issue and how can you avoid it? The question is, um, what about spam? How do we avoid? Yeah. Mass bot signups. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I do this a lot. Um, I have only seen that once. And um, honestly, in the last last two years of working with really big content creators, I've seen it one time. And what we did in that case is we switched it. We switched to that form that was being bombarded. We switched that form to a double opt-in, and that ended it. Um, and in fact, what you can do is usually they grab a um, you know, they'll, they'll grab a, a certain form code or whatever, and they'll put it, you know, they'll write a script to try to try to bombard it. So there are ways around that you, you know, get rid of that code. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have a, I don't have a perfect answer for that one. Um, but it, it is a very isolated kind of problem. So Laura Kavan says, after the quick start guide or series, then you move the subscriber to your regular list. I send out personalized messages new post plus bonus seasonal content. Okay, yeah. Um, so what I typically do is I get on the list and then I have, uh, again, this is, this is everybody's situation is different, okay? But the kind of the baseline structure, if, you, if you've got an engaged audience, you need to figure out the cadence. How often do you email? What feels comfortable? Some people don't wanna email very often. Some people um, email once or twice a month, or sorry, not a month, uh, a week. Um, I'm an aggressive emailer. So I, my forever series might go on Tuesday and my broadcast, I call it, might go on Saturday, um, depending on, on my audience and, and the content. And many, like in the case of, I know we have quite a few recipe um, bloggers with Mediavine. So in the case of food, there's quite often very seasonal things to send. Easter's coming up, St. Patrick's Day's around the corner. That doesn't work in like that automated evergreen forever series I was talking about. They still, you can still um, send emails about, oh my gosh, guys, it's Memorial Day weekend's coming up this week. And we've got some great barbecue suggestions for you to help make your life easier when you go to the barbecue, blah, 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 right? So that's how I do that. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, but certainly, they, and, and, and things pop up. Hey, you're gonna be on the, the Today Show. Okay, great, send an email, right? You know, that's the whole point of having a list is so that we can, we can use it that way. Make the announcement that way. Yeah. So what type of content gets opened and clicked and read? In okay. General? All right. So this goes back to the little bit about that RSS discussion we were having. Um, the big mistake that many people make when sending emails is that they forget that this is not about them, that it's about the reader. So the number one thing that you can do to write to to send content that gets open clicked and read is to solve your reader's problem so you're hearing me beat beat this drum a little bit ask yourself what what problem am i solving for my reader all right so let's say that in, even in the recipe world um it might seem obvious that okay i've got jalapeno corn dogs um, somebody out there put together a recipe on jalapeno corn dogs. I'm sure it'll, it'll go great. Um, what problem does a jalapeno corn dog solve? So many. So many problems, right? Um, they definitely aren't health related, but they do, you know, um, if you want a quick snack, if you want some comfort food, or you need a grab and go thing for the kids, I don't know. But solve, talk about the problem that you're solving and not just the fact that I have a jalapeno corn dog. So all of your emails should be, it's that old, what's in it for me? Um, your email, if you can't answer the question, what problem am I solving, then you should not be sending that email. Uh, there's some formatting considerations too. It's if you want your stuff to get opened and read and then clicked, uh, short, 
I mean, who, nobody likes to read the big blocks of text. You're going through it on your phone. Most of our emails we're reading on our phones now, the big blocks of text, forget that. Um, we just don't bother. Um, simple words. This is not the place to be, to do your SEO uh, stuff, okay? This is the place to be short, succinct, get to the point. I even recommend one, you know, one per topic or uh, per email, one topic. I know that there, there is exceptions to all rules, okay? So this rule is quite often broken and it's broken successfully by certain people, but, but the general rule of thumb, you're going to have more success when you limit one topic to an email. So if it's about, um, if, a, if it's about barbecue uh, for Memorial Day, don't also talk about your cats or your road trip to, uh, to Branson, whatever, okay? Just focus on the barbecue thing because that's gonna give you the, better, the best open and click action. Oh, and last thing, your links, limit the number of links. Usually I like just one. I know that again, sometimes you feel like you're doing a, a, you know, here's grilling ideas for Memorial Day, you might have five or six, but, but if, you're, if you have one topic, have one link and make it really big, make it a button or really big font so that I can click it with my, my old man thumb on my phone um, and I can see it. And, and also another thing it does, it tells me exactly what you want me to do. It tells me you want me to click that. So anyway, just a couple of tips for you. So you're all not diluting that call that we're actually Exactly. That's much more succinctly put, Jenny. Yes. I'm glad I hope you can hear me. I do my podcast is like, so I hope. Fingers crossed. You know, guys. Okay. So how do you feel about those links that many people send? I'm obsessed with this today. I love guess what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, you probably can guess my answer. Um, I already it all comes the, the voice you just answered me with. Yeah, yeah totally. Uh, it, it just comes back to what problem are you solving? Um, in most cases, it doesn't work great. It creates email paralysis or, 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 or no sense of urgency. Like, okay, I can read that later if I want to. Now, if you're if you are a brand personality, then that works. You know, the people are the people care about the Kardashians' cats. Um, and so if they're talking about their cats and they're talking about, I, I went here to get my foot scrubbed or whatever, I, I don't know, then that might make sense for them. So it just depends on, on what problem are you solving? If you're not a Kardashian, however, or you're, you know, not even close to Kardashian level, then you may just want to think about that reader, what's in it for them. So we're back to the, back to that same, same point. Mm -hmm. Do you have a preferred system for sending out quality? Newsletters, ChatChimp, ConvertKit, maybe like. Oh yeah, no, I get that question a lot too. I've used many of them. My current favorite is ConvertKit. I've been using it very extensively for the last couple of years. I was on MailChimp exclusively before that. I've used the others as I've helped other clients. Um, you know, MailerLite, Mad Mimi, and, and and the like. There's my point here is not to disparage any of them. There's a lot of really great um, email software out there. I just recently chosen to use ConvertKit because for me, it has the best combination of simplicity plus pow uh, powerful features to do this, this all this this crazy stuff that I want to do with email. Um, so it works really well for me. If anybody has specific questions about platforms, I don't know everything about every platform, but I've, I have a lot of experience. So if you're thinking about making a switch or whatever, you can hit me up. I'll be happy to answer those. So you mentioned this a little bit, uh, how the 10th email that your wife sends out is about an affiliate or to make affiliate great. Talk to me a little bit about the relationship between affiliate marketing and email. Yeah, well, um, they really support each other well. Email really supports, just in the same way that email supports a lot of different marketing efforts, okay? It's all, it, it quite often is a, a nice foundation for anything you're doing on social um, or, uh, or anything you're doing in person. I mean, there's a lot that email can do. But anyway, affiliate marketing, I did mention that example. The reason that that, that and if anybody missed it, the gist of it was that after somebody's been in our, our Disney Cruise um, website or on our mailing list for any period of time, about the 10th email they get, deliberately we wait until then before we hit them up with, a, with an offer. And the reason for that is that we've taken that time to build up the trust. As much as you can build trust and solve problems with your readers, man, 
an affiliate offer is just solving another problem. So what problem are you solving? Are you, are you legit? Are you genuine about solving that problem with that affiliate offer? Then yeah. I mean, if your genuine experience was staying at such and such hotel and it was fantastic and you get a kickback through Expedia, I, I support that. I'm down with that. If I trust you, you know, cause I, you and I have a, you and I have a relationship now. We have a, it's not, we're not Facebook friends, but we're email friends, you know? Yeah. So um, I start to, I start to trust. I think you erode trust quickly the minute that it looks like it's just an obvious affiliate play. Um, so, or if it is going to be an obvious affiliate play or a sponsorship in email, that's also another revenue source for a lot of our, you know, a lot of our publishers. Just, ex just disclose that, you know, be real. Um, and I think it's all about just keeping that trust is all. And that's to being careful about what you're going to be showing and having an intimate relationship with products and really knowing and believing that your readers can have a great experience with whatever you're recommending to them. Right. Uh, Terry just said, I heard years ago that you, you should only have a few links in your email. We just stress mm -hmm. that the moment, but let's repeat, what are your thoughts of linking out more than one or two times in an email? Again, as long as you're not diluting the, your call to action. So, and it, for me, it still goes back to, are you solving the reader's problem? That is the most important thing to me. So um, if the thing, if the email topic is um, about, um, uh, well, you know, use the Memorial Day barbecue recipe, you might have ribs, you might have a salad, you might have cornbread, you know, you might, these would be all different links, no, but not. it's still solving that same problem. Um, and if you have, uh, you know, uh, Trying to think of other examples. As long as as long as those you're on the same topic, you're on the same theme, and they answer the links solve the problem, then sure, go for it. I just use that that rule of thumb of one link per topic because usually I'm trying to link them back to my site. If I'm trying to link them back to my site where the content already exists, that's I'm going to have the links on that on that blog post. Um, I got I just want to get them from their computer or their phone into my website and that's the job that the email needs to do. So as long as we can get that email to do its job, that's how I think about that. So we talked about this a little bit earlier. Do you recommend only calling subscription lists in order to keep costs down? And how do you go about that? You said you cut like crazy. So how yeah, do you I cut, I cut like crazy. Uh, I, I have a schedule where, where once or twice a month, um, I get, uh, you know, I've got a, 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 and in my software that I use, it tells me um, each one does it a little bit different. So Mailchimp does it differently than than Mad Mimi, than ConvertKit and whatnot. So you need to consult with your with your software, but they will tell you who has opened and who has clicked emails from you. If somebody hasn't opened or, or clicked email from you in the last two to three months, the, and you're a regular emailer like I am, I'm going to move them on. Off they go. Now. I also will do, usually I'll do a win back campaign. A win back campaign is basically in your software, you isolate those people, you send them an email that says, is this goodbye or something like that, where they can then click it. And if they click it, then yeah, they've opened and clicked and it takes them out now of that bucket. If they don't, then I'm just taking that bucket and I'm going delete or unsubscribe. And then of course, letting my uh, ESP know so that they don't, so that I can drop down in billing. A lot of them, it's just a, if you're on ConvertKit, by the way, a little public service announcement, they don't automatically drop you down. So make sure that you you send them a quick chat and say, hey, I I just cut a few thousand subscribers. Yeah, that's very helpful. Okay, Jack, can we have more tips for email titles to drop people in and anything to avoid? So let's talk titles. Okay, so subject lines. So subject line is, it's the window to the soul of an email. <laughs> Very poetic. Um, so a subject line, if they say no to our subject line, they've said no to everything else. So the subject line has, as he mentioned, is, you know, that's so important. The, the best formula that I've ever found for a, for a subject line that I can do consistently, sometimes you strike gold and you, you type something out and you hit it. But the, as far as a formula, it's, it's um, curiosity plus self-interest. So if you can marry those two in a subject line, let's go back. 
the most powerful Disney cruise tip I ever learned, right? If you're going on a Disney cruise, okay, A, your self-interest is, well, I got to know that, you know, or that tip is going to help me on my Disney cruise. And the curiosity is he didn't tell me what it was. So I got to know what it is. The most powerful, then, you know, I got to know what that is. So if you can combine curiosity plus um, self-interest, you have something special there. Now it needs to be genuine. You have to have a payoff at the end or other, uh, over time you will just, again, erode trust. You know, I couldn't just keep throwing out the superlatives like the most, the best, the ultimate. Right. I've been known to use hyperbole a little bit, um, but that's the, that's the key formula right there. And it takes practice. So some people are just naturally good at it and others I've heard I don't know that I agree with this per se, but as a rule of thumb, spend as much time on your subject line as you did on the body copy, because it's that important. They're not going to get to the body copy if they don't get past the subject line. I hope that helps. Yeah, absolutely. So Sherry asks, what about images in your emails? What about, I'm sorry? Images. Oh, well, there you are. That Jenny, that, that works. You just lean forward and then we'll hear you. Okay. <laughs> extreme close up. Extreme right. close -ups. Perfect. Uh, all right, so images in your email. So this is a, a debated topic, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna punt a little bit here. So the main thing that we're trying let's just talk about what we're trying to solve as we ask this question. Images in email really. Um, there's two things. Number one is deliverability, and number two is does the image give away? You know, is the image itself all they need? Meaning, does it fulfill their hopes and dreams and they don't actually need to click through on uh, uh, to your link? I'm gonna address the first one first. If I knew the answer to exactly how Gmail does stuff and puts it into their promotions tab and Outlook and Yahoo do the same things, I'd probably be selling you a different course <laughs> because that would be worth a lot of money. Um, the rule of thumb is generally speaking, their triggers, they know promotional stuff when they see it based off your past patterns and behavior, words that, that you used and you know the types of images that you have or if you have images. The way I think about it is Google's not going to stop you from sending a, a natural email to your mom. So what would you have in an email that you would send to your mom? Probably not laden with a whole bunch of promotional graphics nor will it say the word free or limited time only, mom. Um, although I might get better results with my mom if I start using those words. The, the idea though is, is, is to simplify. So I have, I know that a bunch of images might cause that trigger, but with food in particular, sometimes you gotta just gotta show the cheesecake. You gotta show the cheesecake, Jenny, sometimes. Yeah. So it's a, I'm punting a little bit. I'm sorry I'm not giving you a definitive answer, um, but that's, it's a tricky one. It's a super tricky one and it's hotly contested. Um, kind of depends, I guess. I love that what you send in an email to your mom. That's it's really helpful to avoid the or sales. Don Yoder says, I don't like sounds like I've been to all the how to write subject lines that open email webinars. Nobody likes sounds like them. You are very <laughs> you are on the right track. You're avoiding that. Okay, so what metrics and analytics should we be looking at to help us grow our lists and learn about how our readers are reading our emails? Yeah, okay, good question. So I get asked a lot, are my open rates good? Are my click rates good? Um, and the, the first thing I want you to, to, to stop doing if you're doing this is don't compare yourself to somebody else. Your list has its own history, it has its own readership, it has its own, um, however you got them on there, it has uh, uh, different topics have more or less engagement, okay? On my same, list or a huge list of subscribers, I could have one super engaged segment and one less engaged segment. So stop worrying about comparing yourself to other people and just metrics are relative to your business. The number of your subscribers is actually just a vanity metric if it's if you're not pruning and, and doing that regularly. Um, what you want to do is you want to improve, be worried about improving each of these metrics. So the metrics you are obviously list growth. So the number of subscribers, um, your open rates, you always want that to be improving, but I, there are situations where 
it may not the open rate may not be if it's not improving or it's going down it's really not that big a deal because your your pipeline of people coming in is so much larger so that it's just naturally going to have lower open rate but your raw gains are going to be much better so again um it's uh, every campaign is relative click through rate this is simply telling you how often are they taking the next step which for most of us is to get them back to our website Probably the most important metric for me is total number of raw clicks. Because what do I want with an email list? Ultimately, I want engagement. I want growth of fans and I want growth of web traffic or sales or page views or ads. That's usually what I want. And the best way to measure that is total number of raw clicks. Now, if that's my metric, I could have different ways to try to accomplish that. I could have super hyper targeted campaigns and opt-ins and I could have bigger pipeline stuff like, Hey, everybody who likes cheesecake, you know? Um, and then I'm just going to be pruning those at different rates. But my, at the, the end result for me is, is growing the total number of raw clicks. That's how I, that's how my business actually grows. So those other metrics are simply relative to track how I'm moving depending on my strategy. John says, I'm printing my list today. I was surprised to see less cold subscribers than I thought, but I'm not sure what a good open rate percentage is. Yeah, again, um, Don, it's going to depend on what did it used to be? What have you been sending? Um, uh, you know, how big is the list? Did you, you know, I had somebody that has a massive, massive list because she acquired them all through, she did some giveaways two years ago and she had 30,000 people on her list. And she's like, why are my open rates 5%? Well, let's, you know, we can kind of use some common sense here. So I, again, Don, I'm sorry. Yeah, it just goes to, it depends on your your, your current situation. We have my Amy Lieberman on all the time and she's an attorney and her favorite is the lawyer and depends. Yeah, yeah. It's just the way it is. So how long should emails be? Is there an IP account? Um, yeah, okay, so whatever it is, whatever you wrote, so this is the way I write an email. I will just write, and then I take it and I, I challenge myself to cut my word count in half. Okay. I'm not gonna give you an exact number of word count. I've seen some people, Neil Patel, if anybody who knows who he is, he sends out emails that are two lines long, and they're very effective, and they're, they're exactly what I need. He states a problem, and he says, here's where you get your solution, so I click it. Other people need to set up the problem and exacerbate it a little bit and then give you the solution. But whatever you do, challenge yourself to say it in fewer words. So just write it and then cut the words in half. But don't actually cut the words in half. That would be weird. Cut your word count in half. Be confusing. Yes. Just take out half the words. Just yeah. arbitrary. <laughs> yeah. from your, from your all, all, all the are go now gone. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how do you determine the day and time for the newsletter for how often should they be sent out? And you're an aggressive emailer. This is going to be another depends answer. I can feel it. Like. Yeah, no, you're starting to, and we're going to send a title. Matt Mullen says depends on everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some, some folks have, you know, let's talk about food. I discovered in working with food bloggers that people apparently like to eat food multiple times a day and sometimes a lot of it. So um, you can get away with those, with sending those people maybe a few more emails than you otherwise would if you were an attorney talking about, you know, DWI defense. I mean, how many emails per day would I need on that? I'm, so I'm not sure how often, so you kind of have to ask yourself. And also it has to do with how good is your content? If you've got, if you've got so much great content, you're going to solve somebody's problems. And you, I mean, legitimately, I'm not just saying you feel good about it and your mom likes you and likes your content. No, you, lit, you, you really, truly solve somebody's problems with your content. Then you can email more because you have more of it. And the experience on the other end with that reader is going to be a positive one. Man, Jenny, she knows her stuff. And every time she sends me something, so I'm happy to open it. So you have to be real with yourself on that. Uh, determine time and day to send newsletters. So... Um, Gosh, there's been there have been studies on this, and again, it will depend on your on your topic. But I'm usually leaning towards the morning. Um, that's usually when I send things out. 
or if not, I do it right at about um, seven o'clock if I can. Um, but again, with you know the, the the time time zones and whatnot, that that can be a challenge. So anywhere between that four to seven p.m. range. So I kind of bookmark it there. But having said that, I can think of emails I send at noon. I mean, I, it just it depends on what, who your audience is. When do you think they'll be on their device? Um, when will you be best in front of them? Um, the day the, the day is super important, especially in the the recipe world. The recipe world is traffic is on Saturday, Sundays, and Mondays for most people. That's you get a big chunk of your traffic on those days. So why not email them at somewhere in that spectrum when they are already thinking about meal planning or they're making their Sunday after church dinner or whatever it is. Absolutely. It depends. It <laughs> Michelle Price said, I feel like I'm reading my newsletter all along based on what you're saying, but I like receiving newsletters in style. I do them. Ugh. Uh, sorry, Michelle. No, I, <laughs> Michelle, you're great. I'm sure it's wonderful. Jacqueline Caldrum says, is a simple single call newsletter the way to go or do something fancier? Um, okay, so this goes. This is a little bit of a deliverability challenge issue for me and also a, a practical matter. I, I, do as, I do as little as I can. I do the minimalistic as, how am I saying this? I go as minimalistic as I can with my templates and get away with conveying my brand promise. The reason for that is we talked about deliverability earlier. Second is just simplicity. This is a conduit to get them to my content. This is not the content. The conduit is, um, for instance, let's say that I have a, uh, uh, I'm all about home decor. I could create this beautiful thing saying, okay, here's all the farmhouse decor styles. And I could show all those pictures but then they're going to feel like they've got the answer there. They're not as they're not as likely to click through, honestly. So, yes, you want it. You want you want the template to match your brand style, but you also want it to be deliverable. Again, I'm I guess I'm waffling a little bit when I really just want to say, yeah, go simple. That's my that's my belief. I know that content creators are all about how it looks and how it feels, and I I don't discard that at all. I don't discount that at all. I think that's super important. So just figure out what is the the simplest version of yourself. Kristen says, how many segments do you distinguish between your lists? Obviously high engagement and low engagement, but how do you determine, let's say, cheesecake lovers from barbecue lovers? Simply by checking who opens the respective emails? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, Kristen, I'm going to take it a step back, okay? Um, I'm going to go back to, it's not, Yes, the segments are are really important, but let's just go to mark. Let's go to email marketing 101. Or or where where are the question is where are you in your email marketing? If you have the bandwidth and the technical expertise and and the drive to go that segmented, then do it. Because the more you can solve the cheesecake lovers problem, or the more you can solve the person who loves a jalapeno corn dog, whatever her her problem is. The, the closer the connection will be between you and her and you're, you're, you're uh, closer to becoming uh, building a super fan. However, the reality is for most of the people that are tuning into this right now, they're running an RSS driven email um, that maybe they have a welcome series or something set up. But I would start with one and then figure it out from there. Get the most general or cater to the, where's the traffic coming into your site. If some of some of us have pages that it's just obvious because it's getting 20% of our page views. Put something on that page, right? And then figure out the segmentation that makes sense from there. I am still evolving for my blogs and my properties. I change it all the time as I because I come up with new ideas and I think, oh, holy cow, this person, I could put um, I could put some content in here that would serve this person. How do I do that? Okay, now I gotta think about the logic of it. The software technology will do it. It will do all of that. It's whatever you can get straight in your head. So, so yes, if you can, <laughs> segment like crazy. Um, if, if you're just starting out, just start with, you know, one opt-in and then serve great, you know, take your best content and keep serving it back up. That's the easiest way to start. Don Yoder says, Sundays were my best days. I never thought about sending my emails then. I usually send them on Monday when it comes to new recipe. She also says, she tries to post one new recipe a week and only send 
got a newsletter when she posts new recipes. She's trying to figure out the fancy things in cook, cart kit, and funnels, automation sequences. Yeah. Okay, we've got a new question from Ellen Fulkman. And we talked about this a little earlier. She's only new content included. I'll often resurrect all the content for the theme newsletter, like five for my day, favorite reader posts, et cetera. Yeah. So that's a balance. Um, uh, many of my many of my students of my course and my clients, they're like, well, I'm so used to promoting the heck out of my newest thing. And so that's where all my focus is. I'm just asking, is that the right thing? Is today's thing the right thing for your customer's journey? Is that the best thing that you could send them today out of all the content that you've ever created? If it is, then do it. If it's not, do the other thing and keep promoting on social and all the other ways that you promote your current content. There's those people that are on your RSS feed or those people that just type in your URL and come check you out direct. Thanks, mom. But um, you know those people will find your new stuff. But I I still believe create the best path that you can for your for your email subscribers. Perfect. Okay, we've got some sad news. We're down to our last four minutes. So I'm going to ask you a question and then I'm going to have you think about it. We make a couple of announcements. The final question is. How can someone get started with email newsletters without a week, huge weekly time investment? So think on that. And I'm going to go ahead and repeat. If you're wanting three live and free digital resources, okay, video, on growing your list, how to write an email that gets opened and clicked, and how to put your best content on autopilot through email, go to emailfastware.com. That's right there. His paid course, Email on Autopilot, if you're wanting a deeper dive into growing your newsletter. And in addition, that shared with me that he enjoys quiet walks on the beach, there are Swiss concerts, and fierce frogs. All right, they are pretty terrifying. <laughs> frogs are the worst. They're they the worst. Pretty, yeah. Their their movements are erratic. They could jump on you at any time, and they're slimy. Yeah. And the eyes, those eyes. Warts, uh, awful. Yeah. Okay, now what is your answer? Okay, so my my thought is, if you're just getting started today. Think about what is the very, find an opt-in. Um, we talked about the quick start guide. Um, if you go watch those, that free videos that, um, that Jenny was just talking about, it'll talk about that there again with a little bit more detail about how to do that. But I suggest you start with an opt-in, just, just one. Get people onto your list. Then take your very best content of all time. You could do this right now. You could do this in a Google Doc and you could bang out your top five articles of all time. These are probably your money makers or there are others that are buried below that for whatever reason Google didn't, didn't cherish. And then you just put those in order. Just think about that. You have an opt-in, somebody coming into your list and then they had five emails, one every week from you of awesome stuff. How much further along would your email list be if you just did those two things? I think it's a great way to start. It's usually manageable. Um, if you want help with that, I'm here to help. Hit me up on Facebook, whatever, and I'll, I'll point you in the right direction. Um, of course, the course, sales pitch, sales pitch, sales pitch, um, and you know that'll 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 solve all that for you too. But that's that's what I do. So start with that, get going, and you will be super pleased with the results because you'll get engagement immediately because you're solving a problem and people will start writing you back and they'll go, holy cow, that was awesome, thanks so much. And then that just gives you a boost of spirits and you're ready to write the next email. Because most of us are like, I don't like doing things that don't give me any sort of immediate gratification. <laughs> At least if I'm investing in SEO, it's dispassionate. Somebody might click on it and I might get paid. Um, but with email, we're it's a longer play. It's a longer build, but I will tell you, that having that list is going to probably be the most important thing that you can do for the long-term health of your business. And when you get huge and you want to sell them something, man, having that list right there, it is so powerful. Absolutely. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for sticking with me through all these audio issues. I apologize. I now I look like Godzilla Jenny about to eat the mic real close. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for 
making me feel better about the person as a proximity to the camera. Um, Matt is going to be joining us in Chicago. We are so excited to have him at Amazon there. Uh, Amy Schumer just said, as someone who just graduated from math course, she highly recommends it. It's been so great for her. And the way he teaches makes perfect sense. So thanks. She said, great Facebook Live, Jenny and Matt. Can't wait to see you in Chicago. Uh, in two weeks, if you can hear me, we're going to have Tom Jackson from the Raven Media Group talking about why podcasting is going to be an awesome live. We're excited to have you. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. You've been terrific. Thanks, Jenny. All right. You guys have a great day.